it's been a long time. You wouldn't believe it's as hard as it is for three people to get together at the same time. But uh, we went over a song before church tonight. Am I on? Can y'all hear me? I guess I'm used to hearing myself. That's what it is. But uh, we went over a song. I think this is a very timely song, really, in light of the fact of all the current events that we're seeing going on. And I've said before, lately, and I say again tonight, I don't believe it's going to be long until Jesus comes and he tells us in his word when we begin to see all these things come to pass, just lift up our head because our redemption is drawing nigh. And I believe that tonight with all my heart. You pray for us. We'll try to sing this song this time. We've heard the scriptures for so long How Jesus will return We've seen the heart of sinful man His grace so boldly spurned The storm clouds we see gathering now We know it won't be long For all the signs appearing say On this world we'll soon be gone it's time to lift our heads. Time to lift our heads. Redemption draweth nigh. It's time that we get ready for that meeting in the sky. We'll lay our armor down. Lay our armor down. Take up our robe and crown. Robe and crown. For soon we'll hear the trumpet sound and we'll be It's been a long, long time now Since Jesus went away But on the Mount of Olives there Two angels came to say Why stand ye here so gazing at The one who goes away For just the way you see him leave He'll return for you Someday it's time to lift our heads. Redemption draweth nigh. Draweth nigh. It's time that we get ready for that meeting in the sky. We'll lay our armor down. Lay our armor down. Take up my robe and crown. Robe and crown. For soon we'll hear the trumpet sound. Time to lift our hands and all of night. Draw it night. For soon we'll hear the trumpet sound and we'll be heaven bound. For soon we'll hear the trumpet sound and we'll be heaven bound. changed his mind he was going to be preaching tonight on the love of the father so i pulled out one of the old ones tonight we trust this is a blessing to you as i sing tonight the love of god the love of god is greater far than tongue or pen can ever He 
could we with ink the ocean feel and were the skies of parchment made were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade from sky to sky oh love of God how rich how pure how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the same and angels hold. Oh, love of God, how rich, how pure, how measureless and strong it shall Saints and angels Before I read, may I just say, I, I had several people tell me this morning that those of you who are in Sunday school books, the lesson was on the prodigal son this morning. I had no idea that. I probably wouldn't have preached this. You know how we preachers are about pride and worrying about things, and I probably wouldn't have preached this. J.B. said it's unfair that I didn't have nobody to ring the bell on me for, <laughs> before I got through this morning. But uh, I, I didn't know that. But maybe we have some prodigals around here that God's really trying to talk to. <laughs> There's another way to look at that, amen? But uh, anyway, I trust you'll pray for us tonight as we look at these verses Verse number 20, he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to be merry we're going to stop reading here in verse number 24 we, as i said we're going to pick up uh where we left off this morning we're going to talk about uh, the prodigal's reception tonight how he was received he was received by the love of his father. We're going to center our thoughts tonight around the love of this father. Most of what we're going to say is going to be centered around the things I mentioned this morning about uh, how that he fell on his neck and kissed him, how he put a robe on him, shoes on his feet, a ring on his finger, and killed the fatted calf and said, let us eat and be merry. Before we get to that aspect of the message tonight and the Father's love, I want to look at two or three other things that describe to us the love of this Father. First of all, I want to say that the Father's love was enduring. The Father's love was enduring. I do not believe that there was a day that went by but what the father did not love, that prodigal son that had gone away from home. I don't believe there was ever a moment 
that he didn't love him. But I believe even though that that son had no doubt broke his heart and brought much heartache and, and uh, hurt to his father and to his household, I still believe that that father had a love that endured. The Bible says that love suffereth long. And I believe that the love of that father was long-suffering with that son. Now, God forbid the thought tonight that I'm about to say, but I believe as much as I'm standing right here, that if I were to bring disgrace on my Savior tonight, if I were to bring disgrace on this church and on my family and were to go into sin and end up like this prodigal and, and just, I mean, end up bankrupt and in the gutter of sin... I believe with all my heart, no matter where I might be, around this world, around this country, I believe that I could pick up uh, my uh, telephone and I believe I could dial the number of my father, my earthly father, and I believe I could tell him, Dad, I'm in trouble and I, I'm, I'm ashamed of the... The problems that I've caused, the shame and the disgrace. I, I want to come home. I don't have any way to come home. I'm hungry. I don't have anything to eat. I don't have any transportation. And I believe that anywhere in this country that my dad would love me enough that he'd come get me or send for me or do something to help me get home. I don't believe that I could ever do. And I'm ashamed of it, but there has been some times in my life that I live contrary to the will and wishes of my parents. But may I say to you, as I mentioned this morning, I had a mother and a father that kept on loving me, wouldn't give up on me, and a praying mother who just kept praying and praying and praying until God got a hold of my heart. Now, I believe that, that the love of a father is an enduring love. And the Bible said that God... Jehovah has loved us with an everlasting love. And I believe that the love of the Father is an enduring love. I don't believe there's ever a day or a moment that went by but what this Father did not love his Son. Away from home, though it may be. A disgrace, though it may be. A shame and a heartbreak, and a reproach he may be, but I believe the father continued to love this prodigal because you see the love that this father had for his son was not based on what that prodigal did. It was not based on the prodigal at all, but it was based on the father, amen? And I believe that this love was an enduring love. Secondly, I want to say the father's love was an expecting love. Look with me in verse 20. The Bible said, speaking of this prodigal, he arose, came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. I believe that this father's love was not only enduring, but I believe it was expecting. I don't believe when that prodigal, I don't know how long he'd been gone. I don't know how many weeks, how many months, how many years this prodigal had been gone. But I want to say this, I do not believe that the return of this prodigal caught that father by surprise because I believe there was a love in his heart that caused him to get up every day and expect the return of his father. I think it's not without significance that the Bible said when he was yet a great way off that the father saw him. I believe that father got up every day expecting his son to return. I believe he looked down the road and across the way every day and think some, this may be the day that my son comes home. This may be the day that my prodigal son returns home to me. And one day, sure enough, that love that was in his heart expecting the return of that son, he looked up one day and sure enough, he saw him when he was a great way off. I believe love, it was expecting. I believe that there are many, maybe here tonight, or as I said many, there may be people right here tonight, you have sons and daughters away from God. And if you, and if you love them like this father loved his son, your love has endured a lot of heartbreak and heartache and a lot of bitter tears, but you've continued to love. And I believe that you, you've prayed 
You begged, you pleaded for God to watch over them and care for them and to have mercy on them and bring them home. And there's something about that love that is expectant that you expect them to come home. You expect them to come back. You expect God to turn them around. I want to say tonight, there's a God in heaven. If you're here away from him, there's a God in heaven tonight. You'll never wear out his love for you. He'll love you in spite of everything. I don't care how low down, sorry, ridiculous, how, how bad you may be. There's a God in heaven whose love can endure anything you do. He'll keep on loving you. Amen. And there's a God in heaven who expects you to return. His love is expecting. Then I like this again in verse 20. I believe this father's love was not only enduring, not only expecting, but I believe it was exciting. Look in verse 20 again. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran. And ran. I don't know how old this father was. I don't know what kind of physical condition that he was in. But somewhere he found the strength to run. I believe he was, I, I sit over there today, and I don't know if you can see this or not. I get carried away sometime in my imagination but I sit over there today in my office and I tried to, to just see in my mind's eye the expression on that father's face, the excitement when he looked up and saw that son coming home and he broke out in a run and he took off out there to meet that son. I can see the excitement on that father's face, the thrill and the enthusiasm. I don't believe he sat up there on the porch half asleep and waited on his son to drag home but I believe when he looked up there and saw that boy coming home, I believe he took off out there in a run, just like the Bible said, out there to meet him. I want to say to you tonight, God does not condone your sin. God will not compromise his justice for your sin. But I want to tell you, there's a God in heaven tonight that'll meet you halfway if you'll start home. He'll see you coming and he'll run out there to meet you. He won't. Listen, can you imagine this father sitting up there and that son coming home and begging for entrance, begging for acceptance? And that son sitting up there saying, well, I'll think about it. Let's put him out here in the, in the shed out behind the barn out there somewhere and put him on probation for a while and see how he does. No, there was no reluctance about the love of this father, but there was a love that ignited in the heart of this father that when he looked out there and saw that son coming home, that he took off in a run out there to meet him. That's love exciting. He got excited about the return. And I want to tell you, heaven to get excited tonight about your return to the Lord. Churches, listen, churches may sleep. By the way, it's hard for a church to sleep when folks come to Jesus. Did you know that? It's hard for a church to just sit down and die and go to sleep when people are coming to Jesus. There's something about the exciting force of a love that, that, that'll run out there, reach out there, and meet that sinner halfway, more than halfway. I believe God was waiting. I believe this father just waiting. on. He looked up and saw that son coming. He took off in a run out there to meet him. And I believe he was excited about it. I don't believe there was any reluctance or hesitation on his part. But the Bible said when his father saw him, he had compassion. And he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. That brings me to where we want to get to tonight. And that is that love, the love of this father was not only enduring. It was not only expecting and exciting, but it was enriching. It was enriching. It was an enriching love of all these things that was poured out to this prodigal is an expression of this father's love to this son. Now I want to mention these five things tonight related to the enriching love that this father had for his son. First of all, look in verse 20 again, where the Bible said that he ran, fell on his neck, and kissed him. Fell on his neck and kissed him. Now, what does that, what does that kiss speak to us of? What is this symbol of? When that father ran out there and fell on the neck of that son, embraced him, and kissed him. 
I'll tell you what it speaks of. It speaks of forgiveness. It speaks of forgiveness. A kiss is symbolic of forgiveness. You don't believe what I'm talking about? Just think about when you and your wife have an argument. She does you wrong, you do her wrong, and y'all kind of seesaw back and forth and argue a little bit. You know what you do when you make peace? You kiss her, don't you? She kisses you. You know what's implied by that kiss? I've forgiven you. I've forgiven you. Listen, I remember when I was a little boy, and I was thinking about this today, I remember when I was a little boy, and my dad would, when I'd do wrong, my dad was, he'd bring me in chasing me sometimes, and I'd think he's going to kill me sometimes. I'd think that he hated me. I think I, when I do something wrong, I think he's never going to get over this. He's never going to get over this. But do you know what? You know what? After a while, I'd kind of edge him to where he is at and kind of get close to him where he's at. And I was wondering if he's kind of over it. And I'd look at him and I'd kind of wonder if he's over it. And you know, after a while, you know what he'd do? He'd put his arm around me and pull me up close to him and give me a hug and a kiss. And he didn't have to say, son, I love you. He didn't have to say, son, I forgive you. He didn't have to say anything. I knew I was forgiven for what I did just simply because he hugged me and kissed me. You know what I'm talking about tonight? I believe that this, this son knew when that father ran out there and fell on his neck and kissed him that he had experienced forgiveness for all the wrong that he had done that that father had forgiven him. He ran out there and fell on his neck and he kissed him. The kiss of forgiveness. Then there's a second thing that this father did in the expression of his love. Look with me, if you will, in uh, verse 21 and verse 22. The son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. No more worthy to be called thy son. By the way, he never did get to finish what he set out to tell him. But the father stopped him in verse number 22. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. He brought forth, he said, I want you to bring the best robe. Bring the best robe. Now listen, this robe goes back to a Hebrew tradition, to a Jewish tradition. And when he said to bring that best robe, Literally, what he was saying, that the Hebrew rendering of the best robe means the first robe. Now, when this got a hold of me, I like to have a spell. <laughs> that it literally means the first coat is literally what it means. It means the first coat. And what this father was saying is this. I want to see my son in his first coat. Now, every one of us here tonight can identify with what I'm about to say. In fact, I brought something tonight may not mean a thing to you, but I got to think about this today. You know what this is? This is a, a little coat that my daughter Carrie wore when she was in the first grade. Now, I know none of y'all put up little things like this and keep them. My wife and I are probably the only two crazy ones here to put up an old $5 jacket. <laughs> but you know what? When I look at that coat, I was thinking about this. When I look at that coat, I don't remember sleepless nights. I, I don't remember the bitter tears of heartbreak. I don't remember the ruin of sin and how the devil at one time made a bid to do everything in his power to destroy the life of my daughter. I don't remember that when I look at this little coat. But you know what I remember when I look at this little coat? I remember a little old innocent girl who was the apple of her daddy's eye. When I see that little old coat, that's what I see. You know what this father was saying when he said bring out that first coat? He said, I don't want to see my son 
in the rags and in the ruin of his sin. That's not the way I want to see him. I want you to go get that first coat. I want to see him how he used to be. I want to see him when he was innocent before me. I want to see him before sin got a hold of him. I want him to be again like he used to be before he ever went to the far country. I want to tell you something tonight. I want to tell you something tonight. You may be here. You may be in the hog pen, maybe on the bottom, but I want to tell you there's a God in heaven that loves you tonight and his desire is to see you the way that you used to be. He wants to see you in that first coat of innocence. 1 John 1 and 9 explains it. If we confess our sin, and that's exactly what this prodigal did, he came home confessing his sin. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and what? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to tell you tonight, this father's love he, he expressed to this son, he said, bring forth that best robe. Bring forth that first coat. I want to see my son again the way that he used to be. I want to tell you the Lord can restore you to righteousness tonight just like you were. I mean, listen, you can come home and confess and repent of those sins and the blood of Jesus can cleanse you from all your unrighteousness and he can make you whole again. He can make you what you used to be. Now listen, in the eyes of men, people may never be what they used to be. In the eyes of men, people may never look beyond the scars and the ruin of sin. But I want to tell you, this father had a desire to see his son in that coat of innocence. And there's a God in heaven tonight that loves you and he wants to see you wear that coat of innocence. He wants to see you wear that coat and robe of righteousness again. He wants you to be clean and pure and holy before him again. So he brought, he brought forth the robe, which was the first coat. The kiss was forgiveness. The best robe was the first coat. And then there was something else in this story. That is an expression of the Father's love. He said, not only in verse 22, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. But then he said, he said, bring forth the best robe, put it on him and put a ring on his hand. Put a ring on his hand. You know what that ring speaks of? Favor. It speaks of favor. That ring revealed he, this, this ring revealed that he had been accepted as a son and he was to be treated as though he had never been away. It not only restored him to his position as a son, but it restored him to his privilege as a son. And I say to you tonight that when the Lord puts a ring, that's a symbol of the Lord's favor an illustration is found over in the book of Genesis about this ring. And I know that the ring in the scripture has several different significant meanings and different applications that can be made. But I believe that, it, that here is a clear expression of the father's favor to this son, that he was truly accepted as a son and he was to be treated as though he had never went away. You remember Joseph over in the book of Genesis? And you remember when he found favor in the eyes of Pharaoh? Verse number 41 said, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. That's position. And he said in verse 42, And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand, and he put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And the significance was that Pharaoh placed that ring upon the finger of Joseph 
and it was an expression that the king had favored him and given him authority over all the land. And I want to tell you, when that father put that ring on the son, on the finger of that prodigal son, he was telling all those around, I'm restoring him to position and privilege as a son. I am favoring him and restoring him to the position and privilege of my son. You tonight come home to God. And I believe there's a kiss of forgiveness that awaits you. I believe there's a robe tonight of the first coat that the Lord wants to cleanse you and make you innocent of your sin before his sight. And he can do that through the blood of his son. I believe he wants to put a ring on your finger to symbolize his favor to you that he restores you to position and the privilege of a son. There's something else in this story, he said, the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand. And then he said, put shoes on his feet. Now, most of you know that in the scripture that slaves went barefooted. And a barefooted person in the scripture was a, it was a picture of bondage. I mean, you, you look at a, a barefooted person in the scripture and know they were a slave. And it, and, it, and it spoke of bondage. That prodigal came home in the rags and in the ruin of his sin, having come from the far country, had no shoes on his feet. He'd been down there uh, as a servant, he'd been down there in the hog pen feeding the swine that I preached about this morning and that prodigal came home barefooted. But the, but the father said, I want to put some shoes on him and those shoes speak of freedom. You're free now. You're no longer in the bondage of that far country. You're no longer in the bondage of that sin that was represented by that hog pen in that far country. But he said, now you're free in my house. Put some shoes on his feet. I want him to be free. I want to tell you something I was thinking about today. The holiest of men in the Old Testament had to take their shoes off in the presence of, the, of God. But the vilest of men in the New Testament could put their shoes on. <laughs> Amen. That's what the Lord, that's what the Father's love can do. Take the vilest of sinners and put shoes on their feet and deliver them from the bondage of their sin. And bring them to a place they can stand before a holy and a righteous God, having been made righteous and innocent and clean and pure by the blood of God's Son. So here he was, he said, put some shoes on his feet. But the Father's not through expressing his love yet. He said, I, I want you to put a robe on him. I want you to put that first robe, first coat on him. I want you to put shoes on his feet. I want you to put a ring on his hand. But then there's something else in verse number 23. He said, bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Do you know that when that son came home, that he didn't catch that father unaware. He wasn't unprepared. <laughs> Some say that probably this father, when, when that son left and went to the far country, some commentators speculate that that father probably took his best calf and put it up and started feeding it and fattening it up because he knew the day's coming when that son was going to come home and he was going to be prepared. This fatted calf speaks to us of fellowship because he said, bring hither the fatted calf and let us eat. Let us eat. He wasn't worthy to sit at the same table with a father that he had disgraced and broken his heart and been rebellious and disrespectful to. But he said, bring forth the fatted calf and let us eat and be merry. I want to sit down with him. We're going to eat together. You know what Jesus said over in the book of Revelation? 
If any man will open to me, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. And we'll sit down and have sweet fellowship together. I want to tell you tonight, listen, I know. And I, and I said, God won't ever condone sin. He won't ever compromise his justice for your sin. I think sometimes that we're so afraid that we're going to compromise. Isn't it amazing? It's always the other folks when we're, being, when we're crying out for justice. <laughs> Isn't it? I mean... Isn't it amazing it's always the other fellow when we're crying out for justice to be done? But I'll tell you something I believe we're going to answer to God for one of these days in the Baptist church is our treatment of folks that's been forgiven. Amen? Now you hear what I'm saying tonight. I'm not for condoning sin. And I don't believe a person can just go they want to and just run to the altar about every 30 days and make a confession and you know, and, and, and I think even God gets tired of that after a while. He knows if you mean business or not. But I want to tell you something. I believe tonight that if God forgives a man of his sin, we ought to forgive a man of his sin. I'm not talking about compromising justice. I'm talking about the Bible said, when you see a brother stumble and fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness considering thyself also lest thou also be tempted. I believe one of these days that we'll answer to God for our treatment of folks that have been forgiven and restored. You can treat people with the same love of this father. Did the father agree with what this prodigal had did? Did he agree that the prodigal had gone to the far country and wasted his inheritance and ended up in the hog pen a thousand times? No, the father never agreed with that. He disagreed with that just as much when that prodigal came home as when he left, but he loved him just as much when he came home as when he left. And that's the truth we need to get a hold of. That you don't love a person based on what they are. You love a person based on what you are. Are you listening? You see, if I love Ira Bowen the way Christ loves Ira Bowen, it don't have a thing in the world to do with what Ira Bowen does. It don't have a thing in the world to do with who he is, but it has all together to do with who I am and what I am. Amen? And that's the love of the Father. That's Christian love. It's when you don't make a person live up and you don't make a, first, a person meet your conditions or live, uh, live under your expectation or live up to your expectations. But this father forgave this prodigal son, killed the fatted calf, and sat down at the same table with him and had sweet fellowship. And I believe tonight there's a God in heaven. Your heavenly father tonight loves you regardless of how far away from him you may be tonight. He wants you to come home. And he'll be prepared for you. You won't catch him unaware. He's got a fatted calf. He's got the table spread for you. He had the provisions for you ever went away. And that's the way God operates. Did you know God had a sacrifice before Adam ever sinned? Before the foundation of the world, before Adam ever sinned, God had the remedy already. And this, I believe, he said, kill the fatted calf. Kill that one. And another thing we're told from reading that, that it was not that unusual for a family that had livestock to have a calf put, a, put aside and fattened up for special occasions and special festivities. And I want to tell you there's not a greater festivity in all this world than when people come home to God. And he said, kill the fatted calf. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. I'll tell you something else that I like about this. Love not only enriching, but the latter part, verse Verse 23 or verse 24 is love exclaiming. He said, this is my son. I want y'all to know he's my son. He was dead, but he's alive again. 
This, this father wasn't ashamed of his son. He, didn't, he, he wasn't bashful or backward about everybody knowing he's my son. <laughs> Let me ask you something back there, Sister Sylvia. Are you ashamed of who that fella is sitting on the pew with you tonight? <laughs> Why, at the drop of a hat, and, and, and see if Albert either one would drop the hat and say, this is my son sitting here by us. I know they've shed some tears, spent some sleepless nights, but there's a son that God turned his life around and brought him home and they're not ashamed to say, this is my son and that's exactly what this father's exclamation was. He said, this is my son that was dead. He's alive again. Oh, he was gone to the far country, but he's home now and I want everybody to know he's my son. I don't know about you, but to think there's a God in heaven Nobody else may never be proud of you. Nobody else may never forgive or forget you going to the far country and bottoming out and ended up bankrupt. But there's a God in heaven that's proud to claim you if you'll come home tonight. <laughs> to still say, this is my son. This is my son. This is my son. Well, every head's bowed and every eye closed. They come get a song ready. The Father's love. Are you here tonight away from God and need to come home? Maybe you're here tonight, you've never experienced saving grace. You've never experienced the joy of sins forgiven. You can come to Jesus tonight. Say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I can't save myself, but I believe Jesus died for me. And I here and now by faith accept the blood of Jesus as payment for my sin. And the Lord will save you tonight. You may be here and maybe you're saved. And you're away from God in the far country like this prodigal was. And I want to say to you tonight, the Father still loves you. He still cares about you. He still wants you to come home. He still longs for fellowship. That's your purpose for him is for you to fellowship with him and to glorify him. And he still longs for fellowship. And he won't deny you. He won't deny you, but if you'll come tonight and return to him, he'll be proud to say, this is my son, this is my daughter. Would you come home to God tonight? Father, take the message. May you carry it to the hearts of those that are here tonight. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior, for those that may be here tonight that has drifted away from God. They're living in the far country, but some reason, some way, somehow, you permitted them to be here in this building and in this service tonight to hear this message. I pray this would be the night they'd come home Help them to return. Those that may be here that has never known you, help them to come tonight. Blessing the invitation. May your spirit and your power give liberty to this part of the service. Make it easy for people to come to Jesus. And we'll praise you and we'll thank you for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.